Bill Nye said that when you deny evolution, quote, your worldview just becomes crazy, just untenable, itself inconsistent, unquote. And uh, John St uh, Steer, Australian atheist, he said, quote, creationism is not the alternative to evolution. Ignorance is, unquote. What do these people seek to get out of these comments? You know, how are we going to make comfort like this? Well, I don't think you convert anybody by insulting them. That's, that's the premise from which I'd start. Now, I'm not familiar with the Australian guy that you mentioned, but I do know Bill Nye, the science guy, and I think he's been a great public educator. Um, his children's programs have been terrific for getting kids interested in science, and I have a lot of respect for him that way. And in the video of which you spoke, which has been circulating around YouTube, mm -hmm. he made an important point, and it's a point with which I agree. And the point that he made is if you personally wish to believe in things that modern science tells us are false, namely that the Earth is six to 10,000 years old and humans walked alongside of dinosaurs and all this other stuff, go ahead, believe whatever you want. But please, please don't impress those beliefs on children. Don't demand that our schools teach them. And the reason for that is we need those children we need the next generation to embrace science because we need scientific literacy to solve our problems. To that extent, I agree completely with Mr. Nye's point. Where I'd part company with him is basically in insulting the people who don't agree with me. I, don't, I, I, I think what you do, and what I've always tried to do with people who reject evolution, is to ask them what their objections are and then try to answer the objections. Scientists are interested in the world, first of all not in a political or moral or religious agenda. Now many people who oppose evolution don't believe that. Many people think that, I'll take myself, that the reason that I've sp outspoken on evolution is because I want to convert everyone to atheism or agnosticism. And it often comes as a surprise to those yeah. people to discover that I'm a practicing Catholic. So in your debates with, and dialogues with creationists, um, is science really the main concern or is it religion? Well, I put it a different way, whether the main concern is science or religion. <clears throat> Pardon me. I think the principal concern is philosophical. And that is, where do you place scientific reason in terms of the hierarchy of ideas? And I would argue that I certainly believe and I think most scientists believe that scientific reason is the only way we really have to find out the truth about the natural world, to find out how things work today and what things were like in the past. And in many ways, these arguments with so-called scientific creationists are about the primacy of scientific reason. And if you investigate the natural world by making a number of faith-based assumptions and then telling science what it must discover, that's simply not going to work because that misunderstands the relationship between faith and reason. I think a proper respect for the gifts of faith and reason is to say that yes, scientific reason is the way that we will understand the natural world as much as we are capable of, uh, of understanding it as human beings. But scientific reason doesn't answer every question that is worth answering. It doesn't tell us, as the Greeks would have said, what the good life is. It doesn't tell us what the difference is between good and evil. It doesn't tell us how we should organize and live our lives. And above all, it can't answer one of the most important questions, which is about the purpose of existence. And the reason for that is science can't answer questions about purpose at all. So therefore, science has to be agnostic, if you will. Yeah about questions of purpose and meaning and value. And I think that's where faith guides us, and I think faith guides us in that respect in a very important way. We often forget that even non-literal uh, narrative can express truth. Um, Indeed, no, and I think that's an important point, and, and it's funny because many people understand that in ordinary discourse. For example, um, one of my favorite American writers, maybe my favorite, is William Faulkner. And I think Faulkner's novels 
especially of the American South, are without parallel. And I don't think anyone would be surprised if I said there is great truth in Faulkner stories, in Absalom, Absalom, in As I Lay Dying, uh, in The Wild Palms, and his other stories and novellas. But let's suppose someone to say, wait a minute, Faulkner wrote fiction. He made everything up. How can there be truth in that? Well, the answer is Faulkner's truth is a much deeper truth than a mere historical record like a newspaper of the history of the American South or the history of all of us as a people. Faulkner's truth is much deeper. So I think there are easy ways to understand how scripture can also convey great truths without being strictly historical or strictly scientific. And understanding that, I think, is the key to understanding why the scriptures were written in the first place.